Deep in the Hundred Acre Woods, a young boy named Christopher Robin came across some most unusual adolescent creatures. Crossbreeds, who some would describe as abominations. You're listening to Fun with Horror with your hosts, Scotty and Andrew. This is Andrew. And this is Scotty. And welcome to episode 96 of Fun with Horror. Now, this week, we're doing things a little bit differently. If you a listen to differently, the, thank you. If we listen to the last episode, the very end, you may have heard that we are going to have a special guest today. Scotty, who do we have here today? Well, Andrew, you and I recently discussed a movie called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. In that discussion, we mentioned a couple things. Number one, that we really loved the musical score to that movie. Yes, absolutely. We both said that. It was beautiful. Number two, we mentioned that the composer's name was Andrew Scott Bell <laughs> and that it would be amazing to hire a third co-host named Bell. Right. So that we were Andrew Scott and Bell on the podcast. Exactly. Exactly. Buddy, our wishes have come true. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we had the distinct honor. It, it's a huge honor because it's huge. Andrew Scott Bell, the composer, messaged me after he heard our podcast. We had a nice conversation through private message and everything, and he agreed to do an interview with us. So awesome. I mean, seriously, what an honor. That was so cool to have him have him even know who we are and say hi. That's so cool. Yeah, he, he was very appreciative of our review. He liked it. He liked the podcast, and uh, he volunteered to come on and do an interview. So amazing. But one thing I do want to say, mm -hmm. we do get into spoilers in this episode. Yes, for sure. So just a quick warning before we get into it. If you have not seen Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, there will be spoilers for the movie. You may yes. or may not care about that, but there you go. You've so, been warned. <laughs> you've been warned. Without further ado, let's get to the interview. Here we are. Told you it wouldn't take that long. Come on, I know exactly where to go now. You said that two hours ago. Nearly there. Promise. Okay, one more hour. One more hour. If not, we're turning back. Okay. Hey, everybody out there. Okay, if you listened to our wonderful Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey episode, Andrew and I, we 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 have kind of a bucket list item. Andrew, what is that item? Well, we want we wanted three on this podcast. We wanted Andrew, Scott, and Bell. Well, guess what? Guess what, buddy? What? We have it. Andrew hey. Scott Bell, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Andrew, Scott, and Bell. I'll be Bell. <laughs> yes. <We're all> here. <laughs> oh man, thank you so there much. There must be more than this provincial life. Okay, that's okay. We just got sued. We just got a strike from Disney. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Andrew it. Scott Bell, welcome to the podcast. This yeah, is yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for it's having fantastic. me. You know, yeah. I I I reached out to you guys because I just loved. I mean, adored listening to your episode on our movie. Oh, um, it was just so refreshing to listen to some people who like really enjoyed the movie and really got what we were going for. I think. You know, I mean, there's like we didn't make a perfect movie and there's some valid criticism that's going around. But I, I often feel as I see because I don't want to take anything for granted. So I'm like soaking all this up like this might be this might be it for me. I don't know. I hope it's not. I hope my career continues to grow and blossom and I get to meet new creative people and work on new things that reach a global audience. But, you know, this is the first time that um, a film that I worked on has reached this amount of people. So I soak everything in good or bad, you know, constructive or not. 
And it just seems like a lot of people are piling on just to pile on onto a micro budget movie. We made this movie for $50,000. <laughs> Um, That's so to, to listen to you guys, like I always kind of like hold my breath when I start listening to a pie and I listen to a lot, uh, but to listen to you guys, like really get it and, and, and say, and understand and like meet us where we were in terms of budget and then enjoy us for what we made. I, I, I completely loved that. And, uh, I really appreciate you guys doing that and taking the time to, to understand like where we were as filmmakers in terms of like, you know. You know, we made this for, I, I always say to people, we made this for as much money as like Universal Studios and Blumhouse spent on food in a day for Halloween kills. <laughs> it's like $50,000. That's like a catering budget for a big budget movie, you know? Yeah. Um, so that puts it in perspective for a lot of people who are just like, this is the worst movie I've ever seen, you know? And I'm like, I think you guys need to see more movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I honestly, I, you know, Andrew agrees with me. I can't even fathom why somebody would think it's the worst movie they've ever seen. No, there is so much. I mean, we said it in our episode, but there was so much to be impressed about. Mm. Yes. And obviously part of it was your score, which we will talk about, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, that all that is to say that I'm just delighted to be with you guys and I appreciate the time you took and the, you know, giving your honest and joyful feedback on our movie. That was a lot of fun to listen to that episode. Thank you for the uh, kind words. I'm going to I'm going to have a hard time walking through my door with the big head I have now. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. And as Andrew knows, um, I'm really big into movie scores and uh, and compositions. I've been listening to them my entire life. My dad would constantly buy the big scores on vinyl like Star Wars, Superman. And so it's always been a huge part of watching movies for me. So mm -hmm. I wasn't just blowing smoke up your butt when I said your score is absolutely one of the best horror movie scores I've heard this year. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's For really sure. great. Yeah. That means so, a lot. Uh, I know, I know you have to do more because I, I won't uh, stand for you not doing anything else. So no, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we will pick it. Well, now my head won't fit through the door. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I'm gonna have to expand all my doors to be the French, you know, double doors. Right. Well, let's start with some horror movie talk. I assume you enjoy horror movies. Yeah, I love horror movies. I've really, especially in the past um, like half decade or so, I've really come to they've they've been they've become a piece of me and who I am and like my viewing, you know. Though I think, you know, I mean, I'll let you ask, ask the question, but I didn't always, it's not that I didn't always enjoy horror, but it's that I, I came late to the party, if that makes sense. No, that's actually what I was going to ask you. Like what got you into horror movies? Where, where did it start for you? Well, I think, uh, there's kind of, a lot of people have these horror origin stories and the, <laughs> um, I think the horror origin story for me, though it didn't like manifest into like me seeking out child's play or Halloween, but if I can think of like the earliest time that I was horrified by something and it was fun, was we went to when I grew up in this really small town in upstate New York called Horseheads. And I say upstate New York because when I say New York, everyone says, what borough, you know, but really it's like, you know, central New York, not quite upstate, like not Rochester, uh, closer to the Pennsylvania border. It's called, it's called Horseheads and it was close to Elmira or Corning. Some, some people might recognize Elmira or Corning. And we had one movie theater in town at the mall, but we also had a, in the summer only because it snowed pretty heavily my, when I, when I was growing up, we had a drive-in movie theater and I think that year was they always paired like a kid movie with an adult movie, but never like a rated R adult movie, you know, on Saturdays they would do, like on Fridays. I think they had some rated R movies, but then Saturdays was like kid movie and adult movie. And you could like buy a ticket to both and like your mm -hmm. kids would hopefully fall asleep in the back seat, And then you could watch a as an, as an adult with kids, you could watch a movie and, you know, stay for the adult PG 13 or whatever PG or whatever. And so I think it was Free Willy. I remember watching Free Willy and I fell asleep. I mean, it's a fun movie, but I i mean, I was young, you know, so I fell asleep. And the movie that they paired Free Willy with was Jurassic Park that summer. And I woke up during Jurassic Park in the backseat of our like station wagon during the T-Rex scene where he's like kill, 
trying to eat the kids and I'm in the backseat of this car, just like having this like out of body experience. Like, is this something that could really happen to me? But instead of being like (laughs) terrified, I was like thrilled. You know what I mean? It was just such, such a joyful, thrilling, fun, but also kind of terrifying experience. But then I didn't really, I didn't really come to horror. You know, I didn't, I didn't take that experience and go, I'm going to, you know, because I think a lot of people consider Jurassic Park, and I, I certainly do as well, to be a horror movie. But it's not the same as like It or, you know, Chucky, Child's Play or Halloween. And so it's, it's you know, I think that I took that and turned into like this adventure kick. Like I really loved these adventure movies that had some thrilling aspects growing up. But then in 2012, I think it was, or 2011, a couple of years after I was, I, I scored my first feature film in 2009. That was a documentary about crab fishing men, crab fishing in the Chesapeake Bay. In 2011, I joined a group of people that I knew to do a, what's called a 48 hour film festival. Mm, okay. When you, if you know anything about the 48 hour film festival, like in order to make sure that like, everyone's making their movies in 48 hours, you show up on a Friday and you get assigned a genre a line of dialogue that you have to include in the script and like, like an object and like, you know, like a character name, all these things so that they know that you didn't like write the script and shoot it beforehand. Right. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. So the team that I was a part of, we had no idea we got assigned horror and like all these other aspects. And I was like, well, you know, well, what do I do? Like, I don't really know much about horror plus the film, like the group I was with, like I had nothing to do until they edited the movie. Right. It's like, you have two days to, write the script. So you write it Friday night, maybe you shoot it Saturday and you edit it like Saturday night. And then you do post-production on Sunday morning and you have to deliver by 5 PM on Sunday or whatever it is. It's like 5 PM Friday to 5 PM Sunday. And so on Friday night, while they were all like writing the script and like, you know, doing all this stuff, me and my recording engineer at the time, we went and we watched the first insidious movie (laughs) in theaters. Oh yeah. Yep. And if you've seen that movie, you both have seen that movie. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. there's a scare with a red face like that yeah. just shows it's a, it's like probably one of the most famous scares in the movie. Yeah. It shows up behind like just half the face. You know what I mean? Just yeah, yeah. And I don't even think me describing it would spoil it because the 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 startle of it happening is the scare. You know, but it's yeah. like just half of the face behind somebody. In that scare, a woman a couple rows in front of me like was we were all scared. Everyone jumped, everyone screamed. But she was so she had this giant bucket of popcorn, you know? And she was so scared that she like jolted up and like jolted the popcorn and the whole bucket like flew up in front of the screen and like everybody <laughs> saw the popcorn like flying like confetti. And we all in this moment of like complete terror and the endorphins that come from being scared, we laughed with that person and like the whole theater like cheered and laughed. And that's when it first like hit me that, oh, this is what horror is, this communal experience, the process of like feeling these endorphins and then feeling like we survived with people and then like having this community of people that we survive with, that's what horror is. And that's when, that's the kind of the bug that bit me. But then as you will, like I didn't score a, a horror movie again until 2018, I think, or 2017 when I did a movie called Foxwood. And okay. that started the chain of, you know, this movie led to that movie. And people, people have hired me for horror since those. And I think it's really the seed of origin is, is the movie Foxwood, which the soundtrack is on Spotify. It's a complete homage to, John Carpenter and mm-hmm. um, Bernstein from, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. It's a complete homage to 80s and and it's got some homages to Psycho and it's kind of like a love letter to to horror movies. That the entire score even though it's a short film has so many references to so many great horror scores throughout the decades that, you know, you could list you could listen to it and and pick up all the easter eggs like, "Oh, I think that's the you know, he's in the bathroom and we're kind of referencing the shower scene music. You right. know, it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. And so from there, I think um, people have just continued to hire me and I've built up a, um, I think a re- I'm really proud of the career and the people that I've worked with from those, you know, just word of mouth, just, you know, meeting people and them hearing my music and, and, and horror, I think is a lot of fun to work on. So they're the, I think, awesome. um, what they say is follow your bliss. And if you're having fun, then people are having fun listening or watching, you know, write what excites you, they say. 
I think that's kind of the long winded. I think that's the end of the podcast because I think I took so long. <laughs> We're at the no hour way. mark. <laughs> no I mean, way. We still got a few questions, but yeah, you definitely answered like five questions in one there. So thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry about no, that. No, no, it's good. That's, that's perfect. That was that's awesome. <laughs> so I guess you talked a little bit about your relationship, but do you have just for for all of us that like to know? Do you have a favorite horror movie? Anything a favorite. Oh, that's so hard. I know. <laughs> like, um, would it be Insidious or something else? It, it, Insidious is is up there because that was like that first experience. But I really love, you know, a couple years later, actually a couple years before Insidious, uh, I think it was. I watched. I was I was living in this shed. I mean, it was literally a shed in the back of my friend's house. Like my friend had just my friend was graduated from college. He was a teacher. And I was like, literally, he was like, there's a shed in the back of my house. It doesn't have heat, but it has air conditioning. So I was like living in the shed in the back of his house, which was awesome because I could, you know, I didn't have like, I wasn't sharing walls. So I could like, I mean, it really was like smaller than this room that I'm in now. Like it was a shed, an insulated shed. But anyways, everyone was out of town that one weekend. And I went inside and I, you know, cause I mean, I would hang out inside. We all had, he had roommates to help pay for the house that he just bought, you know, and help pay for the mortgage. But it was always like, you know, they were watching this or we had to like agree what to watch. But when they were out of town, I, I would like have the main house to myself. So I'd like cook dinner and like watch whatever I wanted to watch. And I watched, I, I pulled the lazy boy right in front of the TV so that it was like a big movie screen, you know? Uh, and I watched Drag Me to Hell, and I just had such a fun time. I just <laughs> love that movie so much. Uh, so Drag Me to Hell is one of my favorites. Um, Psycho is one of my favorites because it, from a musical standpoint, oh my, God, it has yes. kind of defined. Mm -hmm. It has, yeah, it has kind of defined like everything you hear in horror, at least from an orchestral perspective. You know, strings and stuff. It really was a benchmark that said you're going you're going to be copying this for the rest of, you know, a hundred years, you know, in, in horror music. And I think so often about the influence that Bernard Herrmann has had on Danny Elfman, the influence that Bernard Herrmann has had on Chris Young, uh, mm -hmm. certainly the influence he's had on me. A lot of people have compared some of my string writing to his string writing. And I take that as one of the highest compliments that I almost can't accept, but I, I graciously do. Mm -hmm. um, Harry Manfred. Yeah, I think... What's that? Harry Manfredini. He's mentioned oh. uh, he's mentioned oh. Bernard Herrmann quite a bit when he's talking about his uh, Friday the 13th scores. Absolutely. I mean, I think Bernard Herrmann is like the father of, of uh, modern horror scores as much as like John Williams is the father of like everything else. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and even yeah. so, like I think I was just talking about this with somebody. Um, you, can, you can draw a, a straight line connection from Psycho to Jaws in terms of style yes. mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, how much it seems. And it's very apparent that John Williams was doing a Bernard Herrmann-esque slasher, you know, chun, 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 chun. those mm -hmm. chugs, those huge dry, not, not a lot of reverb, just those really dry. Chun, 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 chun. That's like that rhythmic <laughs> string thing is such a Bernard Herrmann trope. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's the father, I think, of all of our, yeah, Manfredini, I can totally see that too. <laughs> now, now with horror movies, before we get too far into music, uh, one question that Andrew and I love to ask people, is there something in horror movies that actually scares you that might sit with you after a movie is over and just really gets under your skin? Well, I have a fear of jellyfish, but there's not a lot of horror movies <laughs> that have uh, jellyfish in them, though that, I, think, I think part of the origin of that, that fear was the movie Sphere. You've seen the oh, movie yeah. Sphere yeah. with um, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Samuel L. Jackson and Sh uh, Sharon Stone. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Sharon Stone based on yeah. a Michael Crichton novel. Yeah. Oh, my God. It is. You're right. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's absolutely true. That's kind of a horror movie, kind of a thriller, suspense, you know, whatever. I don't know how they would, you know, you have to look on IMDb, but I would consider that a horror movie. Uh, but that just that jellyfish scene where the jellyfish like get inside of the of the wetsuit, like, <laughs> oh, it just really creeps me out. What about other underwater things? Yeah, I think underwater things, uh, closeness, like claustrophobia, I think that has a lot to do with jellyfish. You know, the, the, the inability to escape, you know, um, okay. I think anytime a character is in a place, like 
outside of our element as human beings. That's what terrifies me the most. Maybe like space, I think would, was, is something that terrified, you know, the, you know, like alien, I never really, and especially aliens, which is kind of more of an action movie, but you never get the feeling that like, I mean, they're trapped on the ship, but then like space isn't as much a part of that story as like it is in like deep horizon or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But for sure, like, you know, being trapped underwater, swimming, you know, where we can't really move fast enough to get away from the shark or whatever, those things really terrify me. Or like, you know, being stuck like in mud or something like that. If like, if you're running through the woods and you get trapped in like a bush or, you know, among a bunch of weeds and you're like, those are the kinds of, that's the time in horror movies that I get really like, oh, you know, like really <laughs> suspenseful, the, the really like, you know, choked up, I guess. Um, but when it's like in a house and you're just like, don't go up the stairs. Like, I'm like, ah, she's going to go up the stairs because it's a horror movie. You know, that doesn't scare me as much as it scares other people. It's the human beings out of our element that really gets me. Yeah. Because I can imagine a, a scenario when I'm, you know, swimming. I mean, truly, like I said, I grew up in upstate New York and we were surrounded by a bunch of lakes. There's a, there's a bunch of lakes there called the Finger Lakes, which are glacial mm -hmm. lakes. And so we grew up like boating and tubing, my family. And when I was 13, we moved to Virginia Beach. I was a moody 13-year-old. So I think in an effort to appease me, my dad was like, well, let's go boating. And we went boating in the Chesapeake Bay and I was on the tube. And the whole point of like my dad boating and us tubing was like, the whole point was like to throw us off the tube. And so we would hold on <laughs> as long as possible to keep him from winning the game. But eventually he won by like spinning around really fast or something. Uh, and I flew off the tube in the Chesapeake Bay and landed in a swarm of jellyfish in like the middle of August. Uh, so that's partly where my phobia comes from. And I just was like stuck there. I couldn't swim to shore. I couldn't swim back to the boat. I had to wait for the boat to come back. Meanwhile, all these little jellyfish are just, uh, they, they're stinging. They don't have eyeballs. They're just like feeling around, stinging with their tentacles. Like, ugh, they were just really gross me out. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I was helpless. I couldn't do anything to get away from them in that moment. So I think that might be why that that terrifies me. So thanks for asking. Yeah, you, we're gonna you're gonna get so many messages with photos of jellyfish. Yeah, <laughs> they really, they really, you know, I mean, it's not a phobia that like it's not like snakes or spiders. You know, I feel I feel for people who have a phobia of spiders because spiders are in our homes. Jellyfish so far have not. <laughs> traversed onto land. So it's a phobia that is relatively easy to go about my life with, but they really freak me out. I, my, my old drummer and my old band is afraid of birds and I just don't know how he ever leaves the house. <laughs> wow. <You know? laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that would be a tough one. All right. So we'll, I, now let's jump. We want to know some composing stuff. We want to know all sorts of stuff. So I yeah. know you, before we jumped into this, you gave us just a little bit that you went to school, but kind of what's your, what's your origin story when mm. it comes to composing? How did you, how'd you get to do what you do? That's a great question. Thank you. I think when I look back on my youth, it's clear now in hindsight that I've always wanted to be part of storytelling, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I used to want to animate. I think every, everyone who grew up in the nineties wanted to be an animator for Disney. I think that's pretty common. But then I kind of turned to wanting to be like Jim Davis. Like I wanted to have a comic strip in the newspaper, uh, like Garfield or Calvin and Hobbes. And I was really, so that, so you can see I was really into art, but there's with, still with a seed of storytelling. And then I think, you know, I, I found my parents or not found, but I started to use my parents' video camera and I would try to try to wrangle my friends into filming movies with me and like give them scripts and idea and they never really wanted to do it. So when I was pretty, maybe like 11 or 12, my friend Kevin and I went hit out in the woods and we called our friend. I can't remember her name. So I'm just going to say Alyssa and invited her over and then filmed from the woods as she like knocked on the door and didn't answer. And she was like yelling, like, where are you guys? I can hear you laughing. And we called that one the Blair bitch or something like that. I remember, you know, um, so that was probably pretty mean to Alyssa, but you know, we were 11, 11 year old boys, 
But eventually, like, my friends were like, oh, that's lame. I don't want to, like, make movies. And I didn't really have – in a small town, I couldn't really, like, wrangle enough people. So I started to get into claymation. And I would – the way I would do that is I would point the camera and then, like, press the red button once, like, twice, like, really fast so that it took what's, in, in essence, like a picture, you know? <laughs> um, just like – uh, and then I would move the clay and and move the clay and – uh, so that was kind of fun, but you know, so I thought I wanted to be a director, um, but then around that age, maybe a little earlier, uh, I don't really exactly remember the timeline. I found a two disc soundtrack to Forrest Gump that was mostly all pop popular music, rock music from like, you know, Bob Dylan and stuff like that from the, cause that movie spans like many decades. Right. So the soundtrack I feel like every boomer like owned that soundtrack because it was like the soundtrack to their lives, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the last track on the second disc was a suite, an orchestral suite from the soundtrack, from the score for by Alan Silvestri. And that just, I just really remember that like lighting the sparks in my head uh, in such a way that I'll never forget. And I would, and I moved my stereo from my bedroom down into where the piano was and I would like run home from school and like throw my backpack on the ground and like press play. And I just learned, I didn't know how to read music because my parents attempts to teach me piano lessons were all failed because it was all old ladies like telling me to follow the rules. And I just hated that. <laughs> so I came back to music on my own through listening and learning by ear. And I still remember It's burned in my brain, you know. That's awesome. Wow. Uh, wow. So yeah, that I think that's my 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 true origin story. And then just to piggyback off of that, I did, you know I wanted to, and then I was writing music uh, more just for fun. But then around I don't know, I guess it was two thousand or two thousand one, whenever Gladiator was up for best musical score, and I and I watched those Oscars like religiously, like I was like watching the Super Bowl that year. Uh, and that's when I realized like, oh, this is a job I can, I can say, I can do, I, I can want to do this with my life, you know? So there's the origin and then and of my love of music. And cause I, cause from that Forrest Gump soundtrack track, I, I then started to write my own music on piano and like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, this one, this song is about a dragon who finds a boy. And then so that you're playing it. And then like the part where they like, where he flies on the dragon's back and you're like, like what I was doing was like reverse engineering a movie. I was <laughs> writing the music and like making up the movie in my head, you know, uh, which is the opposite as, as how it works in the real life. But I didn't know that I was doing that inventing movies as I was so that's why I say I think I always wanted to be a storyteller because – and then I just found the way that that brought me the most joy was through music. And now I get to tell stories and help other people tell stories through my writing of music for their movies. And I, it's really the the joy of my life. That is beautiful. Um, that is beautiful. What, what instruments do you know how to play or did you learn how to play when you were learning how to compose? Yeah, so I like I said, I I came back to music uh, through my ear training, uh, through listening and playing by ear on the piano initially. Mm -hmm. But then when I was I don't know, I guess in like ninth grade or something, not a lot of girls are very interested in guys who play the piano, or at least they weren't back in two thousand and two <laughs> or whatever. So I I started to play the guitar. And I there sing as well. I, I started a high school band and I was, I was even in a band in college and we, I like left school to go off and to San Diego and get signed with that band. So I play guitar, I play piano, I sing in high school. I played the trumpet, but then what's, what's interesting. And I played a little drums and of course, bass guitar. If you play guitar, you can find your way around a bass guitar. But then what's interesting about going to school where I did was they had these classes called the techniques classes, which were initially kind of designed for music education majors so that a teacher who's going to, you know, let's say you're a clarinet player, you played clarinet in high school and now you're in school and you want to be a band teacher. You want to graduate and be a band teacher. Well, 
they have these techniques courses so that even though you play the clarinet, you take the techniques courses, woodwind techniques, brass techniques, string techniques, vocal techniques, and percussion techniques. So you can get your hands on all these other instruments that your students will be playing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that when your student comes and says, you know, what's the fingering for the, for this? And you, you know, you don't know, but you remember, hopefully you remember, or you, or you have the, the charts that you got from those classes and you can, you know, whatever. And I think that it, it, they, those classes, they, I think what happened in, in school is they didn't really know what to do with our composition students, their composition students. I mean, we had orchestration and we had more advanced music theory than other students had to take, like post-tonal music theory and orchestration, which was like, you could choose to take it, but it was a requirement. I mean, that we had some classes that were just for composition majors, but since there were so few of us, I mean, there were like seven of us, you know? Yeah, yeah. They didn't really know what to, how, to, how else to fill up our, our itinerary or our schedule. So <laughs> I, I, and I think they were like, well, that kind of makes sense. And at least at the time... That's what it felt like to me as a student. And I hated those techniques courses. But now that I look back on that part of my life, they're probably the most valuable classes that I took because now I have a clarinet and I have a trombone because oh. I learned, because what you, you yeah. actually physically play those instruments and you have to take proficiency exams up into a fifth grade reading level for those instruments. So I had to play the clarinet, the flute. The trombone, the French horn, the trumpet, which I already knew how to play, you know, the violin, the cello. I had to sing, take percussion. I had to play snare and like marimba, you know, xylophone, all of that at a, like a fifth grade level. So I'm not going to sit here and claim that I'm the best clarinet player ever, but I have a clarinet and I have a trombone. And what else? Oh, we know you are. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I think that served me really well, not only in the way that like if, if I need to just whip out a clarinet solo, I can at least get it in like 10 takes and piece them together. But it also, it served me really well, like knowing and feeling those instruments so that I can better write for them and better orchestrate for them. You know, that coupled with my orchestration class was probably the most valuable thing that I took in school. So I play a bunch of instruments, but I'm not going to list them all because <laughs> they're, uh, they're most of them are like at a fifth grade level. And I think that's, that's cheating. I don't know. I heard clarinet, so you're forever a clarinet player. For right. Me. <laughs> Benny, I'm Benny Goodman over here, basically. <laughs> do you have a – I know you mentioned some that were influences, but do you have a favorite horror score? And then do you have a horror score that you say is, is underrated? Mm. I think the my favorite is probably Psycho, like I said, um, because yeah. it's just like seminal. I mean it's like the the pivotal turning point. It changed everything. It 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 started this whole new movement, and it brought atonal and aleatoric music into the horror world. And we're still writing that today. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably my favorite. Though I really love anything that Christopher Young does. I think Hellraiser is actually one of my favorites of all time. Oh hell! I mean, his music for Hellraiser and then Hellbound is yeah astounding. Yeah, I remember I remember I I didn't watch either movie for many years. Uh you know, I always loved them. Then years later when I finally turned on Hellraiser again, I had completely forgotten how good the music was and mm -hmm. I was shocked at how how gorgeous it is. Oh, it's fantastic. It's uh that might be my answer for one of the more underrated. Though I mean I like mm -hmm. It's tough because, like, I think a lot of people recognize how great it is, but it's never listed on, like, you know, best horror scores of all time lists, you know, though I think it should be. I think it's – I personally think it's the the predecessor to, like, you know, a lot of Danny Elfman's sound. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Hellraiser yeah. came a couple years before Batman, and if you listen to Hellraiser and then listen to Batman – I hope he's not listening to this podcast because he'll sue me or something, but I just really think – um I really think that that you can draw that line that I think, you know, Elfman at least was aware of what Chris was doing in Hellraiser. And they have similar influences. I also think that might be the case. Like yeah. I don't listen to a lot of Danny Elfman, but people have told me that some of my music sounds like a Danny Elfman score. And I think it's because we have similar influences. So that might also be the case with Elfman and Young in the way that they're both influenced by Bernard Herrmann and, uh, Jerry Goldsmith or, you know, something like that. So I can see that being the case too, but. 
So now Andrew and I, we often talk about modern horror movie scores these days. And, uh, and we always talk about how there's basically two types of horror scores. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is the more orchestral melodic type scores like you did with Winnie the Pooh, blood and honey. Mm -hmm. And the other is more atmospheric scores that basically more set the scene being a more orchestral composer. How do you feel about the more atmospheric scores? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I, I think, um, it's it's not my preference. I I definitely grew up listening to James Horner, Alan Silvestri, John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith. Like I said earlier, Bernard Herrmann. Um, so I see the value and richness that in the opportunity of writing themes. Um, but there's definitely a place, a style, you know, for that style, the more atmospheric style. And I've done some films that are more atmospheric. I feel very fortunate that people are kind of seeking me out for what I would consider more thematic orchestral writing. So I, I get to do that more often. I feel very blessed by that, but it's all, it always comes down to the preference of not only the director, but then like, you know, audience preference as well. And I think we went through, I think in the two thousands and part of the 2010s, we went through kind of a rejection of the themes for that, that, that surged in the nineties, you know, the, the, there was a lot of thematic material in scores in the nineties. Like even if, you know, you watch scream and mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Marco Beltrami score is just the, not only for the first movie, but for the second movie as well. And, you know, it's just so thematic and so huge and uh, lush and vibrant that I think sometimes we, in different decades, we then pivot and audiences kind of get tired of something and they pivot to something else. And I think that's why those atmospheric scores came in and came back. And it's certainly why in the early 2010s and even still now, there was kind of a renaissance of like 80s synth in horror, mm -hmm. just kind of as a rejection of the orchestral boom that happened, I think, in the 90s, you know. So there's definitely a time and place and it's always the, the director's preference. But I know the where my heart lies is a 90 minute feature film is such a fantastic canvas to play with and writing themes for characters or motifs. Like, you know, like it's not always just like a character per theme, like it is in star Wars. Like even in star Wars, there's like the force theme, like the idea of anytime anybody uses the force, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, motifs for the feeling of loss, uh, as we might talk about for, you know, when we talk about Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, there's this theme of abandonment that we tried to pinpoint and write something for. So it's not, it's not always just character to character, but that's where my heart lies. But that doesn't mean that I like, you know, dislike the more atmospheric stuff. And, and sometimes that stuff can be really fun to play with. It just feels more if to me personally, it feels less story driven and more like let's make cool sounds, you know? Um, yeah. But I know that I know other composers should do that a lot and they probably would disagree with me on that because I think each of one of us are at our heart, at the core of our being, we're all storytellers and we're all trying to help tell the story in our own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think yeah. the atmospheric music is more, supporting the images you're seeing on the screen i mean for me i'm like you i grew up with john john williams goldsmith you know as i said earlier i i love listening to soundtracks after the fact mm -hmm. and it's a different type of listening situation with some of these more atmospheric scores for like you know like the conjuring or something you know the conjuring is mm -hmm. a great score it's a little more atmospheric than it is orchestral even though it's got some of that feel to it mm -hmm. but it it gives me a feeling when i I, it, I don't know if that makes sense it gives me a feeling when i listen to the soundtrack apart from the movie mm -hmm. more than when i listen to an orchestral score i'm actually thrown back into the movie right, right. i love i love those pieces of music you know right yeah i think they're just two different you know schools of thought it's funny to me, it seems like I get asked like the, the more atmospheric type of score is like, 
you know, staying out of the way, like you said, kind of like lifting up and supporting. And it feels like I'm asked for that more outside of the horror genre than in the horror genre where it's okay to be big and more present. Um, But also I think it just might be, you know, it just might be who I'm working with and then the music that we're putting out and people seeking me for that. You know, I, I feel very blessed that I've worked with people who like I, I worked on a, a lifetime movie called psycho storm chaser and I'm about to work with that director again in a, it literally a couple of days, I start a new feature with him called tenants. That's really so it's one of the, it's such a fun script. I, I couldn't put it down. So I'm excited to dive in. Um, but in psycho storm, in psycho storm chaser was the second time. I think we worked together. We worked together on a short film before that. And our, our tastes and preferences are just so aligned. First of all, he edited the movie without a temp score for the most part, and then added the temp score in later, which is really fun because then you don't feel as locked in to like, you know, hitting the same musical beats as they did when they were editing, you know, but even when he added the temp score, he was using like the lost world by John Williams and stuff by James Horner from ant from aliens. And it was just, it was just like, it just seems like Buzz Wallach, the director, that director and I, like we have the same, we grew up listening to the same film scores. So that's been a joy. And because I get to write the type of music that I love, it seems like people are seeking me out to write more of it, which is kind of just kind of a blessing. So. There's something wrong with Big He just killed my wife, please. Why are you doing this, please? We used to be friends. Why are you doing this, please? <laughs> Well, I feel like if we if we don't ask some Winnie the Pooh blood and honey questions, we aren't even a podcast. We just quit. <laughs> so I gotta dive into some of these. I'm 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 very curious and very excited. But I guess my first question would be with this with Winnie the Pooh blood and honey. How did you how'd you get involved? Yeah, that's a great question. I was it was about a year ago, um, a, a year ago last month or the month before. I heard whisperings around LA, the LA. So I always say, uh, you know, there's a famous phrase that is like L- Los Angeles or Hollywood is the biggest small town in America. Right. <laughs> you know, cause everybody knows everybody and you work with somebody that knows somebody who worked with somebody, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I always say LA is the biggest small town in America and the horror community in LA is like the biker bar on the outskirts. So it's like even smaller, you know, of the misfits, you know, and we're all out there hanging out, drinking bars and, you know, (laughs) everybody knows everybody who makes horror movies here. We all, it's just such a tight knit group and we're all celebrating each other. It's actually really a positive group too. So I remember hearing like whisperings about this Winnie, like a, like, did you hear about the Winnie the Pooh? Did you hear about the Winnie the Pooh horror movie? And I was just like, that sounds So fun. And this was like a day before it went. It must have been in May. It must have been in May or either May or early June when it went really viral from something on Twitter. So I had heard about it like the day before or two days before. And then it went really viral on Twitter. And I looked up Reese on IMDb, Reese Reese Frank Waterfield, the director, and I found his Instagram. And I just, as I sometimes do, I feel like my career is based off of like, you know, Hail Marys so far. Like the the way that I met Ava DuVernay and ended up scoring her NBC show was a total Hail Mary, Hail Mary on an app called Clubhouse. So this this feels like an extension of like, I feel like a lot of my big moments have been just literal Hail, Hail Marys. I just went, he was posting screenshots as as the movie was going viral and people were going to his, seeking him out and telling him that he's a terrible person for making this movie. Uh, he was posting screenshots of people's comments on his Instagram story, you know, that, which you can reply to. And one of the screenshots he posted was somebody saying like, you're ruining my childhood. And he commented on the story saying like, that's what I want to do. I want to ruin everyone's childhoods. 
And I just replied to that Instagram story with like a violin emoji and said, can I help you? <laughs> and he liked it. Uh, I, what I didn't know at the time was that I knew the cinematographer. I had met Vince Knight uh, many years before at a film festival in Los Angeles and we have mutual friends. So I didn't know that Vince was working on this movie. So what I didn't know uh, until going to the premiere in Mexico City was that Reese saw that he and I knew each other on Instagram and Reese said, Hey, what's, what's up? Do you know this guy, Andrew Scott Bell? And Vince replied with all caps. Yes. Hire him. So wow. I really should thank wow. Vince for that. But yeah, that's how I got involved. Um, but I also didn't, Reese and I talked a little bit on Instagram about like ideas and I kind of pitched to him that we should make this a full core vibe, you know, like lots of strings, lots of kind of plucky, you know, what you would expect from like a full core because it happens, it takes place in the woods. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like we were on the same page with kind of our tastes and what we might be looking for. But then I never really heard back. I never heard like, all right, you, let's do it. Let's work together, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't like to be pushy. I, I might, I might take that initial hail Mary, like, Hey, let's work together or something, but I don't, then I don't push yeah, or at least, yeah. you know, I try not mm -hmm. to. And so I was like, I remember saying to my wife, Ashley, like, Oh, I guess I, I'm, I don't know. I haven't really heard back. Uh, I'll ask him again soon if, if he wants to work together, but you know, if they probably find somebody else and, and we were literally, I mean, I was walking, I had my suitcase in one hand and her suitcase in the other hand, and we were going down to the garage in our apartment complex at the time to go on like a vacation in June of last year. And I get a ding on my phone and we're like, you know, waiting, I'm like waiting to pack the car. And I'm like, so I set down the suitcase and I like look at my phone and it's a WhatsApp group chat that says Winnie the Pooh post production. <laughs> And so I was like, I guess I'm on this movie, <laughs> you know, and then we went on our vacation and that's how that they let amazing. me know that I was the composer. They didn't. That's awesome. And then of course we yeah. signed, we, I got my manager involved and we negotiated and we signed on all that stuff, but it wasn't like they were ever like, Hey, we want you to score it. It was just like, they, they made a group chat for WhatsApp. Cause they're, cause I'm the only one in America. They're all in the UK. That's awesome. That is brilliant. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question and this might be a loaded question. So bear with okay. me, but okay. I'm ready. But when you did the movie, what's, what's kind of your, what's your process? What's your, how do you go about creating a score, especially for something like Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think it's loaded. Okay. Um, <laughs> every project is different and it's always with in close collaboration with the director that I'm working with. Hmm. So Reese and I, like I said, we talked about influences and then you have basically, you know, once the edit is close to finished or ready for you to begin, they, you sit down with the director and you have what's called a spotting session where you just go watch the whole movie and you talk about this scene and what it should feel like and where the music should start and where the music should stop and from whose perspective the music should be, you know, in horror music, it's mostly from the victim's perspective. Though I think in this one, what I think is really interesting about Pooh is it's, it's, he's really the main character of this movie. So some stuff is from his perspective, him and Piglet, you know? Yeah. Um, I actually, I actually felt like most of the movie was from their perspective. Yeah. And that's, it's such an interesting twist. Um, he's almost, you know, like, like Michael Myers is famous now as a main character in the movies, but in the first movie he was like, it was like his introduction, but it's funny that Pooh being, you know, Pooh is, is Disney's like number one grossing character IP or something like that. Like, you know, in terms of stuffed animals and everything, right. Or maybe number two, it might be under Mickey. I don't, he's up there. Right. I, I thought I remembered seeing that he was like their number one in terms of stuffed animals and merchandise and stuff. So he already has this established character. So it really is like his movie basically. But yeah. So when we're, you know, we have that spotting session and we, and then I walk away with like notebooks worth of, or a notebook or a number of pages on a computer document worth of notes for each cue and what it needs to accomplish and all that stuff. And then I just start writing. I normally like to write like a suite of themes. So for that lifetime movie, psycho storm chaser, I wrote like a five minute suite that ended up in part being the closing credits. 
but for for some reason or another that's not the direction i took with this movie even though i had the intention to do it they sent me you know just kind of like hey guys look at this what do you think the opening animation oh, and yeah. i watched that opening animation with the narration from that i can't remember his name but it's really really fantastic voiceover actor mm. And I was just immediately like, that's, I have to start there. So I, and I don't normally do this. I don't normally start at the beginning of the movie. I like to start somewhere in the middle, you know, maybe like a really emotional, not the climax of the movie, not the most important scene, but like something like just underneath, you know, and then I kind of like work my way around so that I'm not doing, I never want to do the end or the beginning first because those are the most important, but I also don't want to do them last, you know, Mm. because sometimes you might be just like burnt out and, so that I always save like the small scenes, you know, like the gas station scene in Pooh or something like that for the end. Cause those are the little, I just need to finish this thing and I've already written everything else. All the big stuff is done, but I never also want to start with the big stuff. That's kind of a general, like that's how I piece it all together. But for whatever reason, this one, like they sent that to us and I was just like, I'm, I have to start with this cause this is, this is the this is the purest form of poo in this movie. Yeah. And yeah. from there we can I can break everything and rip it apart and dismem you know, dismember it or dismantle it and put it back together for the ending. Or, you know, like but here it is like the the essence of poo and who this character is, this storybook whimsical feeling that we'll hint at later. So that's where I started with Pooh was the opening animation. And that was the right place to start because in that opening animation, we get to like just rip it apart. You know, the, he, they eat Eeyore, Christopher abandons them. And from that, oh, I'm, I'm messing it up, but I can actually play it here. I can play yeah, it here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. From that whimsical opening, and then, of course, this. From those two basic themes, I had most of the Christopher Robin and Pooh themes and ideas. There's a little bit of a Christopher Robin theme here in this scene. But that's his own theme yeah. that comes back in its own way. But that opening whimsical... Uh, what is it? Here it starts here. Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. That Winnie the Pooh theme is like he and Christopher's relationship, and it comes back all throughout the movie in this like really dark, fun way. Let me find the one together forever. This is so cool. <laughs> okay, here. Uh, oh, that's Hundred Acre Wood Chipper. Sorry. Together forever is right here. That's the same theme as the opening of the movie. It's just not as whimsical and yeah, joyful. It's in the low cello. I mean, we got the choir coming right here. So I just, I love that. That's the scene where we see that Christopher is actually alive. Spoiler alert. 
Um, <laughs> and then again at the end when uh, Chris smashes him with the car, spoiler alert, and he's walking, he's walking past what he thinks is dead poo laying there smashed between two cars. There's just this... That's that Pooh Christopher relationship with his low choir. So yeah, I mean, I just feel like uh, with that, and then the Sanguis et Mel choir stuff, and then some other themes for other characters. Like there's a really great Maria theme that I'm sad I'll never get to use again. But there's those two themes that I wrote for the opening animation really just became like, all right, this is it. This is the score. And we're, I'm going to get to mix and match and play. And I think of themes as clay that I get to remold. And like, you just heard like from the opening to what we just played, it's the same theme, but it's totally disassembled and reassembled in a different darker tone with lower instruments and a choir instead of woodwinds and flutes, you know, yeah. Um and that's really fun that I get I'm I love doing that on a feature movie. I, I guess that's I, kind I, of did I answer your question? But absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, for <laughs> okay, sure. Okay. That was awesome. That was that was an awesome answer. <laughs> okay. That was so much fun. <laughs> and you actually made me have a realization um while you were playing those pieces, especially the opening theme during the animation, the mm-hmm. whimsical theme. When Andrew and I started this podcast. I think the reason I'm so drawn to your score and especially that piece of music right there is because that is exactly the type of theme I was looking for when we were trying to find intro music. And if you go back and listen to our very first episode, we had a theme that we used that we thought was a little bit too cheerful and not ominous enough. And oh, so okay. then we, we settled on the one we have now. But your piece of music, and I absolutely love the very what's what's the actual name of that first track? Um, the name of it is, and I I took some I took some liberties, but a lot of the times it's it's copied directly from either quotes or chapter titles, right? Or in love. the vein of chapter titles mm-hmm. from the original book. So the first track is called "In Which We Are Introduced to Winnie the Pooh," which is. I think I think verbatim the first chapter of the first Winnie the Pooh book. <laughs> That's amazing. So good. Yeah. And I love it because it, it starts out whimsical, like you said, and then yeah. as it continues, it gets to that dark part of the uh, part of the score, you know? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And now, quite I think quite drastically too. Like it changes on a dime, you know, because the Yeah. And then yeah. winter arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and they ate Eeyore. Yeah. Um now, we talked about it during our episode, uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about the Beehive Lynn? Yeah. Oh, let me get it for you first. All right. So, okay. So the Beehive Lynn, as you guys can see here, I just, mm-hmm. I just took out. So cool. <laughs> is a violin that has been inside of a beehive for, at the time we took it out, about two years. Like with actual bees? With actual bees. When I first signed on to this movie... I guess it was maybe June-ish or something. I remembered an article that I read about an experimental luthier named Tyler Thackeray. He goes on Instagram by Violin Torture. And in this New Yorker article about him, uh, I remember one sentence that was like, where he said, quote, for example, I put a violin inside of, I just put a violin inside of a beehive to see what would happen, right? (laughs) And that was a 2020 article that I read. So this is 2022 now in like June. And I, I had worked, I had found, you know, I'd worked with Tyler on another instrument. So I reached out to Tyler and I said, Hey, whatever happened to that beehive violin? He says to me, Oh, I forgot. I completely forgot about that. Uh, (laughs) Why do you ask? And I'm like, Oh, I'm doing this Winnie the Pooh movie. I, I was wondering if I could like use it on the soundtrack. I think it'd be, you know, it'd be funny. And he was like, well, let me go check on it and see if it's like any good. Cause it's very possible that they, that what the bees could have ignored the violin completely and built the hive on the other. You see this, you see this square wooden frame around the violin. Yeah. yeah. That's the frame of a beehive. And normally like if you've ever seen anybody like take apart a beehive, there's like, I don't know, 
eight of these frames inside of the beehive that the yep. that the hive then fills with honeycomb or drone combs. And there are two different types of combs, some filled with honey and some filled with larvae. So he was like, it's very possible. I mean, I put that thing in there like two years ago. It's very possible that they just ignored it and built their hive in the other you know, seven frames or however many, maybe it's 10 total. I don't remember how many total, six, eight, 10. And I was like, well, you know, I don't want you to touch it because I want to come up with my manager and I want to film the whole thing for, you know, and I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And he's like, I don't, I don't want you to drive all the way from LA to San Francisco and for it to be a bust. And I was just like, well, if it's a bust, then we get to hang out and I get to finally meet you in person and I'll pick up that instrument that, I, that I commissioned the, you can't see it. It's behind me. We talked about it earlier. Yeah. Oh, right. That one. Yeah. Mm. I call it the bear head. He made that mm. for me. Cool. Um, so another I was like, at the very least, instrument, right? yeah, it's another string instrument. Uh, it's got a cigar box base with a paint can lid resonator, but the really cool part about it, and it has bass ukulele strings. The really cool part about that instrument is that it has springs on the inside. So it has its built in spring reverb. So when you plug it in, and you play it, you bow it like a cello. It just resonates and rings for days. Uh, you can. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that one maybe later or or not. But um, so I drove up. I said, "Don't touch it. I want to film it. Even if it's a bust, we'll just hang out and I'll take you out to dinner and it'll be cool to meet you." And as you can see, it was not a bust. They totally built their hive not only around it but inside. And on the documentary that's in the bonus features of the Pooh Blu-ray, mm -hmm. which isn't out in the U S yet for some reason, ah. but it's on, uh, this, the bonus, this bonus feature is also on my YouTube video. So anyone YouTube channel, oh, nice. anyone can go and watch the 24 minute little short film with me and my manager, Mike Rosen going up to meet Tyler and pulling this out. There's also honeycomb inside is what I was saying <laughs> inside the violin, which kind of, I think it changes the sound you know, initially I was just like, it'll be a funny like sight gag and like trivia point for IMDb or something. But it actually turned out to be this crazy sound, which I'll play a little bit for you. But then I'll play a pre-recorded thing that because the real magic of this instrument is when what ha is happens when you layer it like five or six times, you record cool. it and layer the recordings. But oh, here's nice. just the one violin. It doesn't really sound like a violin anymore, but I don't know what else amazing. it sounds like. I know it, it has its awesome. own sound. Yeah. Um, and here I'm going to pull up pre-recorded, you know, the five B high violins like together because one sound sounds pretty good. I mean, that's is a recording of what I just kind of played for you guys. Yeah. But when you layer it five times, I really think it comes to life in its own menacing way. It has. It sounds like bees buzzing. I think <laughs> very much. So, so. awesome. <laughs> and how much did you use that in the actual score of the movie? Oh, I used it all over the place. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it felt like it, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I mean, you can hear it in the lead up to. I think this this moment on the first track. Here it is, right there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. yeah. And it's just chugging in the background. <laughs> Just that's it in the background. I mean, that I used it so all cool. over the place. It's so it's just so such cool. a fun, such a fun one to use. Um, I'm trying to remember what track I used. The pluck, bling, bling, bling. Piglet meets a fiance. <laughs> uh, that could be it. I don't remember. There's a bunch of plucks. That could be it. I don't know. 
I use it a lot. I use it all over the place. I probably should have taken note of which ones exactly, but I mean, if you listen to the score and you've heard that kind of grinding sound, you'll hear it in like oh, every yeah. other track. Totally. That's so cool. Yeah. Part I of mean, the your part, your, yeah. your score, the the soundtrack that you can listen to on Apple Music or whatever, uh Spotify, it's always in my rotation right now. So I constantly oh. hear tracks from it. It's great. Oh, thank you. You must be one of my four, four, four listeners. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people. I, real quick, before we move on from these instruments, I'll play for you the sound of that bear head. One of the things I want to do when we, when we release a bonus, you know, um, like a deluxe edition of the CD, mm-hmm. like a, I, I, don't, I don't know if it'll be, there's some physical releases of the soundtrack that are coming that are very exciting. Cool. Oh. And one of, you know, and maybe one day there will be a bonus bonus feature edition and one of the things I want to do is do like a, do you remember that that uh I can't remember who wrote it. Shame on me. But the Peter and the Wolf thing, uh isn't that Tchaikovsky? Is it Tchaikovsky? Okay. Yeah. I th- I thought so, but I wasn't certain. And and a lot of recordings of Peter and the Wolf, they go like this is the clarinet you know, mm. and like, oh, and then yeah, you like yeah, listen yeah. for the clarinet throughout the whole, you know, the whole suite. And then they're like, this is the bassoon and this, right. And you like, listen. And then I want to do that with uh, the bonus feature. Like I want to say like, this is the bio, the beehive violin, so that when people are listening, <laughs> they can go, Oh, there it is. I hear it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so this is that bear head that I was telling you, the cigar box, mm-hmm. the springs inside, this is that. And you'll now that once you hear it, you'll hear it through the whole soundtrack because I used it a lot. It sounds a bit like a cello, but it has its own dark resonance. It just so it just cool. rings out forever. It's so cool. I love that. I love. That I know. So much. That gave me vibes. I felt it. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. And then the other fun thing I did on this soundtrack, aside from playing my normal cello, there's like the poo power theme that like happens when he like pushes the car or when he's like smashing somebody's head, and that I wanted to do. I wanted to like recreate the biggest cello section that I could imagine. And so I recorded myself because we didn't have a massive budget. So whenever I had these ideas like a choir, Reese would always say, that sounds expensive. And I'd say, no, 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 I'll just do it myself. I'll sing all the parts. <laughs> so in order to make the biggest cello section, you know, I don't know if this is true, but it certainly, I was trying the biggest cello section you've ever heard in a movie. I recorded myself playing the cello part 26 times, which is Whoa. like <laughs> four times larger or something than a normal orchestral cello section. So you can hear that when Winnie the Pooh, when it says, hello, Pooh Bear, and Christopher Robin is like, Pooh, something wrong with Piglet. Those big cello oh, yeah, stabs, yeah. that's like 26 of me <laughs> recording. No, um, I, Pooh. Pooh, <laughs> no, we were friends. to you, Pooh? Piglet. <laughs> big, big, powerful moments. Um I also recorded the violin and some trumpet and trombone stuff. I did. I think there's a clarinet, there's a rogue clarinet solo somewhere when they're rescuing Christopher Robin that I recorded. But the real contribution I think that's interesting outside of the beehive violin and the the bear head is, like I said, um, I had this silly idea. You know, part of the humor of this movie is is not playing it funny, but to to be funny in playing it serious. Which yes. I think is confusing for a lot of viewers because they're like, oh, they're taking this movie so seriously. And it's like, yeah, because I think if we tried to be funny, it would be not funny. Yeah, the only I way- actually – I had a friend who asked me about it after we reviewed it and he hadn't heard the episode yet. He mentioned it as a comedy and I was like, yeah, it's not really a comedy though. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it like it was hard to explain to him that it's not a comedy – but still the movie doesn't take itself too seriously. We're taking the idea of Winnie the Pooh killing people very seriously. Yeah. So that 
it is funny. <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. Yep. Because like, I don't know if we were like having him say catchphrases and stuff and there's nothing wrong with this movie. I love this movie for what it is, but it would be like Zombievers or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Zombievers, but I, I think they made the right choice to say let's, wouldn't it be hysterical if we made Pooh into Michael Myers and treated him like Michael Myers? <laughs> Isn't that, and that's like Reese's sense of humor. Like there's no jokes in this movie, but like when Pooh stomps on someone's head, Reese is like, that's hysterical (laughs) because it's Winnie the Pooh stomping and crushing somebody's skull. (laughs) Like that's what's funny about it. Right. So in, in that vein of like taking something so seriously that it becomes funny, I was like, what if, and I think we're going to take it farther in the sequel. Like I'm going to do more phrases because in this one, we just did one phrase. I was like, what if we had a choir chanting in Latin? Because that's like, you know, think about the ending of uh, Phantom Menace. That's like the most serious a film score oh, could yeah. ever be is when there's like, Kora Mustafa, you know, like <laughs> chanting and whatever. I think um, that that movie is, uses Sanskrit, but, you know, Latin or some other foreign language, foreign other than, you know, ancient language. It's just like the most serious that you could ever be like the omen, right. By Jerry Goldsmith. It's so serious because they're chant, they're singing in Latin. And I was like, but then what if like when people look it up and try (laughs) to look up the translation, it's just the words blood and honey, (laughs) Uh, like the, the ultimate like troll joke or something, you know, like they're like, wow, this is so, why is this composer being so serious? And it's like blood and honey, you know, uh, (laughs) And when I gave that idea to Reese, he said, that sounds expensive. And I said, no, 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 no. I'll just sing it all. So we did this kind of like Russian style men's chorus. Songwis. Head smell. And I just recorded myself like 18 times. Head smell. Songwis. But I think, I think in the sequel, like I would like to go further, like, you know, translate word, phrases like the bear in the woods out for blood or something. I don't know, you know, like longer <laughs> yeah, yeah, sentences, yeah. but of course have the sanguis et mel simple translation. But I, I think it'd be fun to take it further and make other phrases. And so that's what I, that's kind of one of the things I intend to do. Obviously we were both huge fans of your score. So I don't know if you can talk about any of this, but we want to, we want to, we want to follow you, man. We want to see what you're doing next. Can you, I know you mentioned one thing already. Can you talk about any of the stuff you're, that's coming up that you're working on? Again, we yeah, want to follow. well, <laughs> right now they're casting for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Uh, I don't think they've announced the name yet. Uh, so I won't do that. <laughs> Blood like to Honey. The, <laughs> yeah, the way of honey. I think we're gonna go the Avatar route and call it the Winnie the Pooh, the way of honey. <laughs> um, um, I think we should go the aliens route, where we just add an S at the end. Winnie the Pooh, Blood, bloods, bloods and, and honeys. honeys. There you yeah. go. <laughs> um, so they're casting that, and I'm I'm reading all the different versions of the scripts, and so it's it's super fun. I like it's such a fun read. Uh, I think it's, they, they had 50,000, they made this movie for 50,000 and it was really just like all of us having fun. I think we knew because it went viral on Twitter. I think we knew it was going to be like seen by a lot of people, but I don't, we had no idea. I don't think any of us conceived of, I think we all thought best case scenario, this goes on Netflix and it's like a fun Netflix movie and becomes a cult classic. We had no idea that this would be worldwide in theaters and hundreds of thousands and it's still in theaters it's in theaters in japan right now what uh, <laughs> yeah june awesome. the end of june and it's still playing in theaters and they're just they're loving it i'm seeing on twitter just you know people just like loving it over there so That's it's fantastic. crazy that like like all the people have already reported on the box office numbers but they're not they're still they're still growing you know it's amazing I don't, none of us knew that. So the, so the reason I say that is that the sequel is like 10 times the budget or something like they have <laughs> way more money. It's going to be way more kills and <laughs> they're really trying to, we kind of just like made like a fun B movie slasher. We're trying to really dive into the story of Christopher more. Oh yeah. And yeah. Christopher and yeah. Pooh 
and the abandonment that Pooh feels. And it's really good. I, I really love reading all the versions of the script that keep sending me. I'm thankful that they sent it to me, but like, I'm like, guys, great. Sounds great. You know, like I'm like not, I'm not very helpful with script notes. I'm just like, can't wait to score it. Love the new this, one. This yeah. may not be something you can answer, but do you know if you'll be involved with the other horror movie fairy tales that they have planned? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I read some treatments, not full scripts, but I read some treatments for Bambi. Um, <laughs> uh, I certainly intend to be, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't always say schedules and budgets and all the things that go into deciding not only if I want to do a project, but if they want to hire me or bring me back. So nothing is official that I can say, but you know, I know they have big plans for Bambi and Peter Pan and Winnie the Pooh too. Um, but they, those guys, something I really admire about them is a lot of people think like, oh, I need to go to film school. I need to do this. They just went, oh, I want to start making movies. And they made a goal for themselves. Scott uh, Jeffries, the producer on Pooh, and he's going to direct Bambi. He made a goal <laughs> that by 30, he was going to produce 100 movies. And he did it. Whoa. Wow. wow. And like, you know, you know, a lot of other people maybe would have gone to film school and done one feature and tried to get it into Sundance, but he was just like, I just want to start. And all, and the, th the other thing is like, they're all micro budget movies. So, you know, some people might scoff at that, but they've all made money. They've yeah. all been, they're all on Walmart shelves. They're all yeah. making more than they spent to make it. And that's, you know, that's its own accomplishment. I think, you know, um, well, I definitely, I can't wait to buy the physical copy of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey because, Oh yeah. Uh, the the extras, the bonus features are just going to be amazing. Yeah, there's some really fun stuff on it, and I know who's putting it out, and I know I know that it's going to be it's going to be a treat. It's like a, I mean, it's the the American release of this. So many people keep saying like, when is it coming out? When is it coming out? I mean, I just want to say to everyone that it's worth the, it's worth the wait because it's going to be a really really special release in America. Uh, it's already out in the UK. There's a really cool version in Australia, but you need to get a regional free Blu-ray to watch those two right, versions. Right. Yeah. Um, but but the America release is going to be like the creme, you know, the creme de la creme of of all of them. And I know that. So yeah, I can tell you what's going on next. Um, I've got a movie coming up called Tenants by director Buzz Wallach. That I don't know what their plans for it are in terms of distribution, but I know that it's going to be somewhere. And that's a really cool movie. Uh, it's got a bunch of directors. It's an anthology, but it's, it's all connected. It's all one story in the vein of like trick or treat, which was an anthology, but had, but doesn't, you know how you watch like ABCs of death or one that I worked on death December, which has a bunch of non connected stories. Mm -hmm. Well, this one is all, it's called Tenant, So it all takes place in the same apartment building. So each cool. story is its own apartment. And cool. then you, and then part of the watching of all of these other stories is like, why is, is discovering and finding out why all of these horrific things are happening in the same apartment complex on the same day. Uh, so that's a really fun movie. And I've worked on a couple anthologies. I just, one that just was released was called Give Me an A, which is, 17 female filmmakers response to the Dobbs decision, the overturning right. of Roe v. Wade. And I that just came out. That. And I, I kind of wrote like the opening segment theme, you know, and then they used, and then I wrote the music for each of the title cards of each of the shorts. And I did worked on one of the shorts. Normally when I work on an anthology, it's like, like death December, I do the main theme, maybe a couple of the shorts and then the closing credits but I'm really excited to, in this anthology, Tenants, work with Buzz and the other directors. And I'm very excited to write the music from start to finish as its own whole you know, feature film score. I've never gotten to do that before. And I'm really going to, I think I'm really going to enjoy working with a bunch of the different directors each but also having a cohesive sound throughout start to finish so that it, it doesn't feel like you're watching a bunch of five minute installments. You know what I mean? Right. That's awesome. That that's really cool. Really cool. <laughs> so thank you guys. And, and to answer your question about where people can find me and follow yep. me, uh, <laughs> which I think you asked, or were you about to ask? 
you read my mind because we yeah. were going to ask it. That's okay. <laughs> uh, people you're can not follow... only a composer, but you're a psychic too. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's, I think across the board, I'm at Andrew Scott Bell on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. There's a new one called Threads, which yep. just came out. I think across all the board on YouTube and everything, you can find me at Andrew Scott Bell. And my website is andrewscottbellmusic.com. Guys, awesome. I've loved talking with you today. Thanks to the, I feel like I've been doing all the talking. Well, that, that's the point. We want you. <laughs> that's what we want. We want that. <laughs> Nobody's listening for us today. It's all about you. No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it. You've asked really good questions. I think that's why I've been doing all the talking. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast. I mean, yeah. our dreams have, are coming true right now. It's, it's <laughs> Andrew, amazing. Scott, and Bell. And Bell. And plus, I it. finally get to interview an actual movie score composer, which is there you go. That's awesome for me. It's so cool. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna go tell my wife that you called me an actual movie score composer. I think that's really <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. I'm like that's such that's like an honor because I'm always like you know imposter syndrome and stuff. But God, mom, Ashley, they said or no, I'm gonna call my mom and say, Mom, they called me an actual <laughs> movie composer. There you go. No, yeah. uh, if anybody. <laughs> Should not have imposter syndrome. It's you. Correct. Oh. Well, thank you. That's uh, very you've kind. got you've got a huge future ahead of you. So I hope thank so. You. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Seriously, this was awesome. I, this was so much fun. So thank you for doing this. Yeah, was- guys, I had a blast. <laughs> I really had fun. Thank you. The flowers dead. Again, seriously, just a huge thank you to Andrew Scott Bell. That was an awesome interview. We had such an amazing time talking to him. Just a a down-to-earth, amazing human being. Loved it. Great human. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. However, wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh. before that, I just want to say. Lay it on me. As of you and me recording this outro right now, yes, Andrew Scott Bell is the first person besides you and me to have an official Fun With Horror t-shirt. <laughs> yeah! So, Andrew, we hope you're enjoying the shirt. Hopefully you're sporting it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and nothing else. That's it. That's all oh, you're allowed to wear. <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's all we wear. That's That's true. This is why we don't have video podcasts on YouTube. But <laughs> that being said, what are we what are we what's happening in our next episode, man? Help tell people. Well, today is the day that this video this <laughs> the day that this podcast is releasing is Tuesday, as Correct. usual. Yes. But in two days from this day, what? August 10th <gasps> is our two year anniversary. The two year <gasps> anniversary of fun with horror. And we're going to have a very special episode. In fact, I'm not going to tell you what our next movie is. <gasps> it's been chosen. Yeah. And we've discussed it. <laughs> but it's a surprise. Because I, I have a feeling most everybody that listens to this podcast will have seen that movie. Even if they haven't, they'll be surprised and we'll have a spoiler warning and everything. But I think most people have seen the movie. But we have a very special movie and a special little tiny announcement yeah things to come in the future of fun with horror and it's good stuff we're not we're not quitting or anything no 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 it's all good it's all (laughs) good it's all good it's all good all right everybody well thank you for listening to our interview thank you so much thank you thank you join us for our next episode for our two-year anniversary (gasps) see you in two days (laughs) andrew i love you scotty i love you all right (laughs) Talk to you in two days, buddy. See you then. You were remembering how things were, right? You can't stop. The good is still in there, Boo. And stop. I know I caused you a lot of pain. Just let it, let it go, please. No! I'll stay. I'll stay. Just take me instead, please. No, no, you can't. You 
I'll kill you! You saved me. Now it's my turn. Trust me. Go. Let her go. Let her, let her. I'll stay with you forever. Take me in step. You. <laughs> ah!